some of the great leadership that we have at our school, and thank you for also doing a great job at our school, and Kathy Joy. I, I thought we should have had more Kathy, though, on the sound. I know, I'm sure. But uh, Kathy, thank you for also uh, leading the choir today. We appreciate that very much. What a wonderful, wonderful time in music we've had. We'll go ahead and open your Bibles to John, the third chapter. John, the third chapter. Interesting today how the Lord arranges things. Uh, I had scheduled to preach this message and that we, not realizing that we would also have Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Uh, Renee spoke about the preborn child. She did not say the unborn child, she said preborn. That's the term they're using nowadays because we want it to be, they say they want it to be understood that the child has life before it is born. There is life there. The gestation is going on, but the life is there. And so it's just waiting to be born. Today we're going to be talking about spiritual birth. Right now, for some of you, some of you, there's a gestation going on. What's, what's taking place, there, there is the conception and your, the perception of Jesus Christ and the Son of God, but the birth hasn't taken place yet. You have to come to that decision. And what is the greatest need that everyone has? The greatest need that everyone has, more than water, food, oxygen, whatever. The greatest need that everyone has is to be born again. So let's, let's look today at the spiritual birth and the picture that Jesus will show is the physical birth. This probably one of the most famous chapters in the Bible, John chapter 3. Look what it says here. There was a man by the name of Nicodemus, he was from the Pharisees. The Pharisees would be like the, like the Senate today. They were the religious rulers of the day, rulers of the Jews. This man came to them at night. Now the reason why he probably came at night was because he didn't want anybody to find out that he was going to Jesus. Probably was, was shrouded and cloaked in such a way he wasn't wearing his religious garb. Probably looked like just a normal everyday Jew as he came to Jesus by night. Jesus took audience with him, and he said, uh, Rabbi, Jesus, we, we know that you have come from God, uh, be, uh, and uh, that uh, you are, because you are a teacher, no one could perform these signs. Nobody's been able to do. You're as great as one of the prophets. Nobody could do these signs unless God was with him. That's, I mean, that's a good introduction. Jesus cuts right to the heart of the matter. He says, uh, I, I, I'm just going to tell you something, Nicodemus. You may be religious, but you've got to be born again. Otherwise, no one is going to be able to see the kingdom of God. Doesn't matter how religious you are. It matters about the relationship. Verse 4. Then he says, how can anyone, uh, Nicodemus, thinking in logical terms like anyone would, he said, how can anyone be born when he is old? Maybe Nicodemus was old himself, and that's why he used that term. How could uh, anyone be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked him. By the way, hang on to the name Nicodemus. At the end of the message, we're going to tie that name together. All right, it's very, very important, okay? Nicodemus asked him, can he enter into his mother's womb a second time? Now, that was preposterous, but that was just the first thing that came to his mind. Can, can he come into his mother's womb again and be born? Verse 5. Jesus said, I assure you, I'm not talking about that. Unless someone is born of the water, this is physical birth, and the spiritual birth, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, natural birth. Whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. Then he says this, don't be amazed that I've told you you must be. Key word is, I mean, several key words, but the word must. This is not up for a vote or up uh, as far as being an option. You must be born again. And I say that to you today. Everyone here must be born again. Next verse. The wind blows. The wind blows where it pleases and you hear the sound of it, but you really don't know. Really, do you know where it comes from or where it's going? So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. You really don't know, but you know that it's there. You know it comes from the north, going to the south, but you don't know where it originates. Verse 9, 
how can these things be? Nicodemus says, you're, you're blowing my mind. I, I, I can't comprehend this. And so then he says to him this, Nicodemus, come on, man. Come on. Aren't you a teacher of Israel? And you don't know it? I mean, it's all throughout the Old Testament, and yet you don't seem to know this? Then in verse 11, he says, I assure you, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you do not. In other words, you're ignoring all the prophecy. You're ignoring all the testimonies that have been given to you about me and this new birth. And then he comes in and he really nails it, drives it home. I've told you about these things that will happen on earth and you haven't believed. How will you believe if I tell you about things in heaven? Because here's what it all boils down to. No one has ascended into heaven except the one who has descended. That's Jesus. He's talking about himself. The one who has descended from heaven. That would be me, the son of man. Then in verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. Now, some of you are saying, what's this business about picking up snakes in the wilderness? Well, if you would read your Bible, you would know. But some of you don't read your Bible, and you don't have a clue what Jesus is talking about. Go ahead and write in your notes, Numbers 21. Great story uh, there that Jesus is referring to. We, people don't want to read their Bibles, and they say, I don't understand. It's because you have to read the Bible to understand the Bible. So Jesus said to, Mo, uh, to Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the sun must be lifted up. He, he was talking about the prophecy of the cross, dying on the cross. And then in verse 15, everyone who believes in the one who is lifted up being Jesus will have, everyone will have eternal life. And then the most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved, God loved in this very way the world, that he gave his one and only the prototype, none other like him, so that everyone, everyone, everyone who believes in him will not perish. The eternal damnation is what perish means. Will not be under eternal damnation, but will have eternal heavenly life. I mean, what a great, what a great promise. Why would, why would anybody turn away from it? Yet people by the droves, our churches across the South especially, are so gospel hardened that they turn away from this message. But let's see about being born again. The first thing that we want to look at is the newness of being born again. Why do we call it the newness? Well, the Gaithers made the song very famous, the second verse, uh, it says, you know, how sweet to hold, because he lives, how sweet to hold a newborn baby. Now, what is there that is so significant about a newborn baby? Well, one of the things is this, that it is a, for the baby, it's a new, new nature, uh, the, the new nature for the baby. And we experience, when we're born again, a new nature. All things are made new. Look what it says in 1 Peter 1, 13. Because of his great mercy. Oh, that word mercy is powerful. Mercy is not getting the judgment that we do deserve. Everybody, all of us deserve judgment. I, I, want, what I, I want to get what I've got coming to me. <laughs> no, you don't. Uh, you don't want what should be coming to you. God in his great mercy has given us a new birth, being born again into a living hope through the resurrection of the dead. So there is a new nature. This new nature is not talking about a new personality or new looks, new good looks. Some of us could use a new personality and new looks, but no, that's not part of the deal. That's when you get to heaven, praise the Lord. But that is reserved for then. It's not a change of personality. It's not a change of being positive. You know, recently I read this guy, he's real famous in America, you know, big church, big church. And he said, God's got great things for you. Today is going to be a great day. And, you know, everything was just so positive in what he said. And everything that's going to happen to you, just, 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 you know, it's like everything's going to be wonderful for you, what God has in store. And I almost, and then I kept my thumbs, put my thumbs down. <laughs> and I said, nope, don't do it. But I wanted to say, 
Yeah, try telling that to Job, the first and second chapter, what he had to go through. So it's not talking about this positive, everything's going to be wonderful for you uh, while you're here on this earth, but it's talking about a new life that you cannot produce, a new beginning that you cannot have, a, a new forever that you cannot attain on your own. It is the new nature of God within you. The next thing that we see is this, a new experience. A new experience. Like I already said, for a baby, everything's new. They say that for babies, the first 18 months, their intelligence, as far as their understanding, grows at an exponential rate. They just are learning, learning, learning everything. And so they just keep learning through their childhood. And then when they become teenagers, they become blithering idiots. But before then, they are... I'm just, I just lost a youth group, Cliff. But anyway, uh, they, they, you know, learning, learning so much. You experience so many things that are new when you give your heart to Christ. It's a new life that he has given to us. You're like, wow, I never knew that life was like this. It's because it's a new experience. I question people who say, well, I, I didn't really feel anything. I, didn't, I just kind of did it. Well, I'm not saying you have to feel something, but all I know is when the Son of God comes to dwell within you, that is an experiential event, and there ought to have been something about it that was experiential. So it is a new experience. The next thing that we see it is a new world. A new world. One woman said it like this. I don't know if the world has changed or I, because everything in my life has changed. And I see the world from a completely new point of view. Well, yeah, everything has changed. It is a new world. For one thing, probably your language has changed, especially if you're an adult or older when you give your heart to Christ. Your language changes. Maybe your music changes. Maybe your, your friends change. Or maybe your goals in life because it is a new world that you're walking in. You're not walking in this carnal world of dirt here that you have now. But it's a new world because the world that is to come, heaven has come to dwell within your heart. All of the Trinity, all of the Godhead, all of heaven comes to dwell within your soul. It is a new world in the newness of life. The next thing that we see is this. It is a new power. It is a new power. It is a new spiritual power that is greater than anything this world can generate. Greater than any nuclear activity that could take place. Greater than the sun in the sky, the stars in the universe. This power that now resides in you. Let me tell you how powerful it is. The power that dwells in you when you are born again is the power that raised Christ from the dead. There is no greater power than that. Any and everything else pales into comparison. Nothing else can generate heat like that. Nothing else can generate power like that. The scientists are not able to come up with anything, whether it be atomically or anywhere else, that can come to grips with the power of God bringing life to a person who is dead. A person who is walking in darkness now has life. A person who is hopeless now has a future. It is the power of God to save a person and give them eternal life. Everything else is second, third, a far distant tenth place to this. So, in Titus the third chapter, verse 5, we see this. The new birth is regeneration. It's not reformation. You know, a lot's being said today about reformation, and certainly we all need to be doing better, but that's not the end all. It is not reformation. It is regeneration. He is the one who brings life where there is death. It says Titus, the third chapter, he saved us, not by what we can do. You see, that would be reformation. I'm going to try and do better. Works of righteousness. But according to his mercy, through the washing, of regeneration, the new birth, regeneration. Now let's look at the mystery. <clears throat> the mystery, verses 7 and 8. Here is the mystery. The mystery is, in verses 7 and 8, let's, let's look back at it again. 
Don't be amazed when I tell you that you've got to be born again. The wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound, but you don't know where it's going. So it is for a person when they're born again. The mystery is that the Lord God, through the death of Christ on the cross and the power of the Holy Spirit at the resurrection, can change anyone's life. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. There are some people in this world that are doing horrible things. I think about how that ISIS on the other halfway across the globe, how that they are doing horrible things to people and Christians are being slaughtered. And I say, God, please, sometimes I want to say, God, please bring judgment upon them. And the Lord has stopped me in my tracks because he says, you know, they are a soul for whom I died. I sent my son to die. That person can be saved. You may say, how? You see, it's the mystery. The Lord can save anyone. They're, they're, what we're dealing with today in our nation is so, it is so crucial because our nation has lost its soul. It's lost its way. And people today are walking in such great darkness that what we're seeing today are crimes being committed and things being done that we never dreamed about before. The, the inner city crime, the killings, and of course what happened in the school in Kentucky recently and uh, you know, like, how can this happen? And I'll tell you how it happens is that not only is the soul dead, but also, listen, the conscience is gone. The con People today, I don't think you're hearing me. Some of you are, you look like you're somewhere else. I want you to hear me. People today, so many don't have a conscience. I was talking with someone not too long ago, and they said to me, Chuck, you don't understand. Before I, before I came to Christ, I didn't have a conscience. I did what I wanted to do. I made money any way I wanted to make it. I used women. I used drugs. I used people. I would beat people up when I felt like it. I had no conscience. If I did something wrong to somebody, it did not bother me a bit. And I said, I don't know how to. I don't know how to think like that. He said, no, you don't. You grew up in church. You've always had the Spirit of God around you. I had, I had no experience of Christ whatsoever. So that when Christ came, I was not prepared. I knew I needed a Savior, and Jesus came and saved me. I was not prepared for the fact that he would open up my conscience, and I would begin to care like I've never cared before. I would love where I never thought of loving. I would give where I'd never thought of giving. Friends, listen. There is no amount of counseling that can bring a, a, a person around like that. Amen? There, there's no amount of help that can be given to a person to bring a change like that. That's the mystery of being born again. How does it work? It's a supernatural work of God where he brings life into you. But I know, I know that there are some here today who, you know, you're saying, I, I think I can do it on my own. God will understand. I, I think I'll get into heaven. I'm not that bad. Let me tell you what you're trying to do. Look at it like this. Remember this now. Our carnal flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Remember that. Our bodies, our minds, our souls, what we have here cannot enter into heaven. Let's just say that you were part of the crew that was picked and you wanted to do this. You wanted to go to Mars. You know, there's a lot of talk today about going to Mars and colonizing Mars. It, you know, who knows? It may happen. I don't know. I'm not signing up. Just want you to know. But there seems to be a lot of people who want to do this. You're one of those, you, you get on the spaceship, you go to Mars. It takes about nine months to get there. When you get there, you land on Mars, everybody says, okay, let's go, we're going outside. So let's suit up. Everybody suits up and they look at you and you say, I'm not suiting up. Why? Why aren't you suiting up? I can handle it. I'm a tough guy. I, I'm, I can handle it. And they say, wait a minute. The average temperature outside is 100 degrees below zero. Uh, the oxygen content is less than 1%. I know, I know, but I believe I can make it. 
they say, no, don't do it. And so you walk through the airlock, and then the doors open, and you go outside, and sure enough, you do it. About 90 seconds is about as long as you'll last because you don't have the body, you don't have the suit. You've got an earth suit when you need a Mars suit, in other words, to be able to exist there. This earth suit that we have, it's not designed. Sin has ruined it. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. You may say, I don't understand that. Yeah, I know, I don't either. But it's the mystery that we have to be given the spiritual nature. We have to be clothed. You can look at it as being your heavenly suit. We have to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ in order to inherit eternal life and leave this world and go to the world to come. It is the mystery of being born again. Now, very quickly, let's look at some of the marks. What are the marks? First of all, there's a change. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. The old is past. And see, can't you just see? The new has come. If there has not been a change in your life since you gave your heart to Christ, especially as a, an older teenager or an adult that's had baggage and sin and corruption and uh, things in the past, and if there's been no change, there's been no salvation. You can't have, you cannot have Jesus Christ, the Holy Lamb of God, the second person of the Trinity, come into your life and dwell in your soul and there not be a change. The devil has fooled you. You've been deceived. And, and he, has he, right, he has you right where he wants you. There will be a change in the person's life who is born again. The second thing is this, it's repentance. A mark of a Christian is that he's been born again. Repentance is a part of his life. What is repentance? Well, repentance is this. For one thing, it says, I can't look at sin in the same way. It no longer has the pleasure, the attraction. It no longer has the allure that it once did. So sin is not something to be embraced, but sin is like a snake that is poisonous to be shunned. You see, it is, sin, uh, repentance is so important because you don't know that you need a Savior until you, your heart is awakened through repentance that sin has corrupted your soul and that the only hope that you have is Jesus Christ. So another mark of being born again is repentance. Another mark is that of prayer. Prayer. The Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord. Well, that's prayer. And then after calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved, then there is the continued calling upon Him in a time of need. A calling for fellowship, a calling for help, a calling out to Him in praise. There is this prayer that is the oxygen. It is the breath of life in our souls. And then the last thing would be this, the expression. When Christ saves a person and they're born again, there's an expression that goes on in their heart that changes their expression, their life. Literally, there have been people saved. I've seen it happen. And others have come up to them and said, you don't look the same. You know why they don't look the same? It's because the burden of guilt has been taken off. It's because the tragedy of sin has been dealt with. It's because where there is hopelessness, now there is expectation that God is going to be at work. There is an expression, and I wish more in our church, in our church and especially, that we were more expressive of the great things that God has done for us. Listen, it doesn't matter how bad it is in your life. It doesn't matter how tragic it is in my life. I'm not saying putting on a happy face. The Bible says there's a time to grieve. But in the midst of the worst of grief, I can say this. I can say that everything can be taken from me, but my soul is secure in Jesus Christ. My body may be racked with disease, but one day I'll be made whole in heaven forever. I may be poor and have lost everything now, but in heaven I'll have the treasures of eternity. I may be lonely. I may be crying on the inside, but one day I will have total fellowship with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I may be dealing with the past, but one day all of that guilt 
will be taken away and I'll be with him forevermore. Friends, listen, we always have plenty to express unto our Lord. Can I get somebody to say amen on that? It's true. We always have a reason to rejoice for what he has done for us. <laughs> We've always got a reason to rejoice in what he has done for us and what he has not done to us as we deserve. Now what about the process? Let's look at the process. I want you to get this. Take this. Remember this. Use this as a witnessing tool. First of all, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. First of all, God loved. That means God loved you. You may say, well, of course he did. <laughs> Get off of your prideful arrogance. There's nothing about you that is lovable. Puppies and dogs are cute until they bite you. And they're not cute anymore. <laughs> and in essence, we have bitten and bruised the Son of God. So there's nothing lovely about us. But in spite of our dreadfulness and our ugliness, He has gone past that and loved us. Loved us. He has loved us. He has given God love. What greater gift? I don't just don't know if God cares about me. What, what are you wanting? How, how, will, how is it that you will be using the patience of God by saying, God, I just don't know if you really care about me. I, I, I just want you to show that you care. He has given the utmost. He has given the greatest. He has given his all. He has surrendered the supreme sacrifice. You and I cannot even come close. We cannot even touch the hem of the garment. When it comes to sacrifice for what he has done, when he gave, he gave, he gave willingly, knowing that all of your hell and my hell, the flames of hell, okay, would be placed upon Christ. The judgment of that we deserve would be placed. He gave willingly. God loved. God gave. You believe. The word believe is the word we could also say that we trust. You don't trust in yourself. You don't believe in yourself. You believe that you are incapable, unworthy, lost, but you believe that Jesus died and you believe that you will place yourself. I believe Jesus, I can't make it, but Jesus, you have promised that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And God, there's such a stirring in my heart. There's such a longing in my soul. I believe in you as the Son of God to save me from my sins. The last one is this. You receive. You open your heart, holding nothing back. For whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but receive or have everlasting life. God loved, God gave, you believe, you receive. You can take that. And folks, listen, wouldn't it be great if we went out these doors and took that message as a witnessing tool? Anyone from, from the ninth grade, uh, from the nine-year-old to the 90-year-old can take that and use it to witness. Or today, if this is the first time you've ever heard the message of salvation, you can receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior today. Because today is the day of salvation. Now let's just wrap this up. Do you remember who it was that came to Jesus? Now stay with me. Stay with me. Hello, and thank you for joining us this morning on our worship service. I just want to say that we appreciate each one of you that follow along, whether it was from a sermon or from a song that you listened to from us this morning. I want to say that God is alive, and God is doing great and amazing things. If God is speaking to you, I encourage you to tell somebody about that, whether that's somebody that you know or you go to your local church or you come and join us on a Sunday morning or Wednesday night. I want to say that you do not need to remain silent from that decision that God has placed on your heart. 
You need to act on that. God loves you, and God wants you to become one of his children.